Welcome to the Russian Revolution of 1917, Origins and Legacy. The Russian Revolution was one of the most important events of the 20th century. It brought about communism as a major force uh, in world history in this period, and it has impacted the world up to the present. The first part of our discussion will focus on the narrative of the revolution. The second will focus on interpretation, and the third will focus on outcomes how the revolution by the 1930s took on a particular character under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. This cartoon is an excellent example of the state that Russia was in in the years preceding the Russian Revolution. The Russian officer says, Why these fortifications, Your Majesty? Surely the Germans will not get this far. The Tsar replies, But when our own army returns... This really gives us a good sense of, of the morale of the Russian army in the years before 1917 and how the Tsar really feared that uh, not only would the army rebel, but Russia would uh, almost certainly collapse as a result of uh, the horrible uh, losses and devastation brought on by World War One. It's very important to remember that World War One. uh was a very important factor in bringing about the Russian Revolution and that without World War One there would be no revolution. Let's begin with the narrative of the revolution. In 1914 Russia entered World War One on the side of the Allies led by Britain and France against the Central Powers led by Germany and Austria-Hungary. Right away the war effort went badly for the Russians Russian industry could not keep up with the demands of the war. Many Russian soldiers went into battle without guns. They would have to pull rifles off of the dead to continue their advance against the enemy. Russian soldiers who had a rifle were only given 10 bullets a day to fire uh, at the Germans. So morale in the army was very low, and very quickly the war became unpopular back home. In December 1916, Nicholas and his wife Alexandra, the Empress, were dealt a personal blow when Rasputin was assassinated. Rasputin's nickname was the Mad Monk. He was supposedly a monk who had these powers to cure illness, and Nicholas and Alexandra hoped that he would be able to cure their son, Alexis, heir to the throne, who was suffering from hemophilia a deadly disease of the blood which prevented the blood from clotting. So any cut or bruise would be life-threatening to Alexis. Now Rasputin had a very, very bad reputation outside of the palace. Uh, he was a drinker, a womanizer. But to Nicholas and Alexander, he was the man who would cure Alexis's bouts of, of illness uh, when his his joints would swell up with, you know, with pain from this awful disease. So little did Nicholas and Alexander know that Rasputin was helping to damage the regime's credibility in the country because a lot of r rumors went around that Rasputin was involved in all kinds of, 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 of very bad things, very bad behavior, and it reflected very poorly on Nicholas and Alexandra. Things got worse for Nicholas in March 1917 when between the 8th and the 11th of that month riots and demonstrations in St. Petersburg erupted over shortages of bread and coal. As you can imagine, bread and coal were being sent to the front leaving very little for Russians at home to get through the very cold, difficult Russian winter. Many Russians would have to pull down old wooden houses to use the wood for firewood. So morale at home was just as bad as morale at the front. When Nicholas tried to stop the rioting, soldiers joined the demonstrators. Proof positive that the army was losing its loyalty, that Nicholas could not count on them to prevent St. Petersburg from erupting in revolution. In response to the demonstrations on March 11th, 1917, the Duma created the Provisional Government. 
Now, the Duma was the Russian legislature. It didn't have a lot of power under the Tsarist regime. However, the country was in such a crisis that the Duma decided to create a transitional government. Uh, it wasn't meant to be permanent, but as uh, sort of a middle point between the monarchy and a new, a new type of government. Right away, Prince George Love, L-V-O-V, is how it's spelled, became Prime Minister. And Alexander Kerensky, who is pictured here on the left, became Minister of Justice. Kerensky was in his late 30s at the time, very young man, and he was going, he would become a very important member of the provisional government, and more on that uh, later. So events are moving very, very quickly, and Nicholas, uh, at this point, is quickly losing his power. On March 14, 1917, the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies issued Order Number 1. This was a severe blow to Nicholas's authority. The Soviet was made up of socialists and other radicals who believed they spoke on behalf of workers and soldiers. Order Number 1 was their call to Russian soldiers to ignore their officers and instead elect their own officers from their ranks. So basically, order number one told the average Russian soldier, your officers have betrayed you, uh, they were picked by Tsar Nicholas, uh, he no longer has any kind of credibility at home, uh, no credibility on the front, therefore it's up to you to elect people from your own ranks. So this democratization of the army, as as you can imagine, really helped to destroy discipline, because armies don't function well when uh, when officers are ignored and soldiers elect their own their own officers, and that's exactly what was happening at the front. Officers with all kinds of experience were either chased away, shot, or simply ignored, and were shunted aside by by officers who a day or two before were simply privates. Uh, with no <laughs> with no rank whatsoever. In response, on March 15th, 1917, Nicholas II, who had been in Tsar since 1894, stepped down. He abdicated the throne. His brother, Michael, was offered the throne and he wisely declined. It was not considered uh, seriously to have Alexis take the throne. He was still a young boy. Um, so at this point, Nicholas was no longer Tsar, and events would then move very, very quickly. With Nicholas out of power, it was up to the provisional government to prevent the chaos that threatened to rip Russia apart. Between March 11th and November 7th, the provisional government embarked on a series of reforms. All citizens were declared equal before the law. This meant that people in Russia were now citizens, not simply subject to the Tsar's power. This meant they would be able to vote and run for office the way that people did in other democracies, say in Britain, France, or the United States. Secondly, freedom of the press, speech, and assembly were declared to be protected by law. This was important in a country where freedom of the press, speech, and assembly had never existed. People spent long years in prison for speaking out. So the provisional government is trying to put together a democratic order or democratic government. Unions were allowed to form, to allow workers to advocate for their rights. An eight-hour workday was allowed in some industries, industries where workers were not forced to work more than eight hours without being paid. Also, Poland was declared independent. Poland was part of the Russian Empire for decades, and it was seen as an important step forward to allow the Poles to develop their own nation. So Russia was beginning to sort of disengage 
uh, from being this, this, this empire and was moving towards uh, a type of democratic order. However, despite the good intentions of the provisional government, there were problems. Number one, peasants were very unhappy with these reforms because the provisional government, although they took care of the workers, were really at a loss as to how to get land to the peasants. You know, peasants demanded more land. And in a nation where peasants made up 75, 80% of the population, land reform was very important, but the provisional government failed. So what did peasants do? They simply began to seize land on their own. They began to take land and use it to help feed their families and their villages. So this was the beginning of a serious uh, rebellion in the countryside. Also hampering this program was the fact that the police and the army were loyal not to the provisional government, but to the Soviets, okay, in Petrograd and also in Moscow. So the problem with the provisional government's reform program is they don't have the support of the army and police who are needed to keep order in order for these reforms to be successful. The weakness of the provisional government was apparent by midsummer when in July the Bolsheviks attempted a coup d'etat. Now coup d'etat is French for strike at the state. It means to um, overthrow the government. Now the Bolsheviks were supported by radical soldiers, sailors, and mobs who were sick and tired of the war. The provisional government made a serious error by staying in the war uh, to help the French and the British defeat the Germans. The war was so unpopular that uh, it radicalized Russian politics during the summer of 1917. Now on July 20th, Kerensky became prime minister at 38 years old and he was determined to keep Russia in the war to uh, prevent the Germans from, from winning. This was considered at the time to be more important than appeasing Russian popular opinion and it was going to be a major mistake that Kerensky and the provisional government make to stay in this awful uh, unpopular war. Now by the fall of 1917, the Bolsheviks have enough power to stage what is known to history as the Great October Revolution. In our calendar, it happened uh, November 7th, but according to the old Russian calendar, it was October 25th. So for the Soviets, uh, it became the Great October Revolution. Bolshevik troops took control of various buildings and strategic points in Petrograd. The next day, the Winter Palace was stormed. So by this point, the provisional government is now gone. It's over. And we can see that the provisional government made a major mistake putting its offices in the uh, the Winter Palace where the Tsar uh, lived. So in the it was a real public relations disaster because <clears throat> Russian people thought of the provisional government as really kind of an extension of the failed Tsarist regime. This pro-Bolshevik painting um, really gives us a clue as to what's happening, we have this soldier waving this red flag, which is the red flag of, of socialism and communism. So here, um, this pro-Bolshevik pro painting is making really a big deal of the Winter Palace being, being stormed in uh, October of 1917. Now with the Bolsheviks in control of Petrograd, they embarked on an ambitious new economic program. This was called War Communism. The new Soviet state appropriated mining, metallurgical, textile, electrical, timber, tobacco, leather, and cement industries. Railroads were nationalized. Private enterprise disappeared. No more private property, no more private business ownership. Food was rationed by the new state. And land was nationalized, which means 
Not only did they take over the railroads and other industries, but also the government took over the land. So basically, the Bolshevik program is total state control of the economy. This is really what communi- the essence of communism, state control of the economy. What they're trying to do is prevent uh, Russian economy and society from collapsing. Next, <clears throat> on March 3rd, 1918, the Bolshe- Bolsheviks kept their promise to get Russia out of the war against the Germans. Okay, this was seen as a very, very popular move amongst most Russians since the war was so unpopular. And it's really what separated the um, Bolshevik government from the old provisional government. The Bolsheviks decided, let's get out of the war, it's unpopular. Uh, and the Bolsheviks were really able to capitalize on their slogan, which was, peace, land, and bread. The Russian people really found this very attractive. Uh, peace, land, and bread. Very simple motto that worked for them. In the midst of war communism, in the attempt of the Bolsheviks to stabilize the economy, a civil war broke out, which would eventually claim five million lives. It was fought between the Reds, the Bolsheviks and their supporters, and the Whites, who were a mixture of supporters of Nicholas II, who was now under house arrest, anti-Bolsheviks, liberals, those who supported um, liberal uh, democratic government, and also um, army detachments sent by the United States, Britain, and France, uh, who were sent to essentially support the whites against the reds. Remember that uh, the Bolsheviks are hostile to capitalism. The British, Americans, and the French are afraid of the revolution. They're afraid that it's going to spread throughout uh, Europe and the world, and they really believe that this is the time to stop the Reds. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately for them, the uh, the Reds win, and on December 30th, 1922, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or USSR, is founded. So the Bolsheviks are now ready to consolidate their power. During times of war and revolution, charismatic personalities become very prominent. During the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War, Leon Trotsky was one of those characters. Uh, next to Vladimir Lenin, Trotsky is the driving force behind the Bolshevik Party. And his main contribution was as founder of the Red Army. He was the one who got the Red Army organized and really was the one who had engineered the defeat of the whites to ensure that the revolution would survive. And if you look at this postcard on the left, it shows Trotsky in his many different roles, leader of the Red Army, as important uh, intellectual, writing books and articles defending the revolution. And we can see that this postcard really represents the first, one of the first examples of Soviet propaganda, the idea that... Um, the virtues of communism can be seen in everyday items, postcards, hats, uh, pins, you know, things of this nature, posters, movies. And the next slide is going to give us an excellent example of early uh, Bolshevik propaganda with Leon Trotsky at the center. This is a wonderful example of early Soviet propaganda. Here we have the image of Trotsky as a knight, a Soviet knight, riding a white horse. And you can see his spear is stabbing uh, this horrible horrible snake with a top hat. And in Russian it says, counter-revolution, counter-revolution meaning that the snake uh, represents the counter-revolution. All of those forces that supported the whites, you know, the capitalists, uh, for Trotsky and Lenin, they want to create a new Soviet state that's not based on capitalism, but on socialism and communism. The idea that the working class is really the class that should be represented above all else. And for those of you who may understand uh, medieval 
religious imagery, uh, you may think of uh, St. Michael slaying the serpent or some other religious image. It's really the idea of taking an image from religion, from Christianity, and superimposing a political meaning on top of it. And that's what we see here. So this isn't St. Michael. It's really it's really St. Leon, uh, who's not a religious figure, but he's a great political figure. So that's a very important thing to remember about um, modern propaganda, is that very often uh, religion, uh, religious symbolism is used, and the a political meaning is superimposed on top of it. The Nazis are also very, very adept at doing this. This poster is another excellent example of propaganda from the Russian Revolution and Civil War. However, it's not from the Bolshevik side. It's from the white side, the white army side. And <clears throat> it's, a very, it's very disturbing on many different levels. Um, first of all, in Russian, uh, it's, it roughly is translated as the world under the Soviets. And it's uh, the white army trying to tell the Russian people, look, if you go with the Bolsheviks and you go with people like Trotsky, this is what's going to happen. So here you see at the bottom piles of, of skulls. And someone on the right there is being executed, the bottom right. And over the wall is coming this horrible, grotesque monster. And of course he's red because he's, uh, you know, it's it represented communism. And he's wearing a, a pentagram around his neck, which is also a symbol of um, of the devil, of evil. So again, uh, religious symbolism um, is being superimposed here on this political poster. And remember, uh, Russia was filled with millions and millions of Orthodox Christians uh, who, who respond to religious imagery. Now, one of the most disturbing uh, images here and we kick if we kick it up to another level is um, the poster is really a condemnation of Trotsky as a Jew it's an anti-semitic uh, poster as well you can see that um, his face is given these kind of exaggerated features um, which for many people represents uh, his Jewishness and the pentagram can also be seen as a, a twisted star of David. And if we look at, um, if you look to the top left-hand side of the poster, we could see uh, an onion dome with a cross, you know, bent, which is um, not only um, a, sh a stab at um, Trotsky's Jewishness, but it's also a stab at the Bolsheviks' atheism. You know, the Bolsheviks are atheists, uh, and they don't believe in God. And what they want to do is they want to destroy religion. So this poster is very, very disturbing on, on many different levels. Um, it is, it's anti-Bolshevik, but it's also anti-Semitic. Uh, and it's also meant to be an attack on, uh, on, uh, Trotsky personally and on Bolshevism generally. This next slide is titled, Interpreting the Revolution. As you can imagine, historians have grappled with the meaning of 1917 for many years now. And some of the basic questions have really stumped historians and have really polarized historians. Historians do not um, have a broad agreement over what the meaning of the revolution has meant to the world. Did Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin intend to create a Soviet dictatorship? Or was it circumstances that forced them to choose dictatorship over democracy? On the one side, <coughs> we have professors like Richard Pipes, who taught at Harvard University for many years. His view is, 
communism was doomed to fail and it was doomed to become a dictatorship because communism itself itself is bad. It takes away basic freedoms. It takes away private ownership. It, uh, you know, Bolsheviks, by the very nature, support revolutionary action and violence. And therefore, it was doomed from the start to become a dictatorship. It was doomed to create monsters like Stalin and uh, the Gulag and all the other um, awful things that came with the Soviet experience. So that's really one side uh, of, of the debate. The other general side is that, look, <clears throat> it wasn't so much communist ideology that created the dictatorship. It really was circumstances that if you look at the Bolshevik party during the, the revolution and the civil war, it was a democratic party. Uh, people in the party could speak their mind on, on issues. Lenin and Trotsky were part of these great debates on where the revolution should go and what role should ordinary people have in the life of the party. And that because of the massive loss of life, during the Civil War, five million dead there, then World War One, millions dead there, that by 1922, the, the, the Russian economy and infrastructure was so damaged and beyond repair that where else were, would, would the uh, Soviet experience go but towards dictatorship and uh, a pulling together of, uh, of state power and in addition, the kind of investment that a government would need to stabilize an economy and build democratic institutions wasn't there. You know, you need money, you need investment, you need um, other countries to lend you money. And in the 1920s, the United States and Britain were unwilling to do so. And, and by 1929, the world was involved in a major uh Depression. So, what else were the Soviets going to do but essentially centralize all power at the top and develop what we know now as as the Soviet uh, the Soviet experiment in dictatorship? Now that we have a sense of the narrative of the revolution, and we have a sense of the questions that historians have grappled with regarding uh, the revolution. We now need to take a look at Marxism-Leninism, the ideology of the Communist Party and the Soviet Union. An ideology is a set of ideas that determine a person's view of the world. And for communists, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, the great uh, philosophers of the 19th century from Germany, are the ones who provide the greatest inspiration. Marx and Engels, if you remember from uh, World Civ II, those of you who had the chance to take it, uh, these two uh, men believed that socialism was the answer to humanity's problems, and that capitalism, the idea of using workers to make a profit, using their labor, and not compensating them properly for it, was the cause of human suffering and pain. So for them, socialism was the antidote to capitalism. Because in socialism, all of the wealth that is produced by society is shared equally amongst those who produce it, the workers, or as Marx called them, the proletariat. So when we, when we look at someone like uh, Vladimir Lenin, who grew up in the late 19th century, when Marxism was very, very popular, we can see exactly where he's coming from. Um, basically what Le uh, Lenin is going to do is he's going to reinterpret Marx and Engels. He's going to keep the basic ideology of Marxism in place. The idea that the world is made up of exploiters, um, whom he called uh, the bourgeoisie or middle class, and the exploited, the working class or the proletariat. And for People like uh, uh, like Lenin and Trotsky and other Marxists, they believe that the only way to cure the suffering of the working class and to end the kind of exploitation that the bourgeoisie 
placed on them is really through armed, bloody revolution. And for, Mar uh, for Marx and Lenin, they believe that government, culture, and social institutions reflect the social class that holds the economic power. So in his view, before 1917, Russia was in the hands of capitalists. Uh, whether that was completely true or not is a matter of debate. But he believed that through armed revolution, you could actually destroy the bourgeoisie, you could, you could, uh, destroy capitalism and bring about a socialist utopia where the working class would share the fruits of their labor. And this is really the essence of modern communism because for Lenin, the way that you get from uh, a capitalist state to a socialist one is through revolution, but it's also important to remember that the party has is going to have a very important role in that the state, you know, the Soviet government, is going be, to be the means by which socialism is attained. Uh, so that's really where Lenin departs from Marx, is that he says, well, uh, we're going to need a strong Soviet state to redistribute the wealth of Russia so that all workers will be able to enjoy um, their, their, the, the fruits of their hard work and their labor. As mentioned in the previous slide, Lenin was very much influenced by by Karl Marx. Uh, there's no there's no doubting that. Lenin grew up in Russia in the late 19th century, and he knew of the suffering of the working class throughout Europe. He could see in the the, the Russian countryside peasants uh, were suffering. They didn't have a land. Uh, there was poverty and high infant uh, mortality rates and things of this nature, and um, this is really what attracted him to to Marxism, the idea that through armed revolution you could create a society based on working class or proletarian values. So he, he first off he agrees with Marx that the proletariat or the working class is the class of the future, that the bourgeoisie or the middle class those who had owned the factories and the farms and who had exploited the poor, they would be the ones who would lose. They were the ones who would, dis would disappear and the working class would finally have a society that they would control and that would benefit them. Uh, however, you know, Lenin is, is not stupid. He realizes that Marx was talking about Britain as really the the place where the great proletarian revolution would probably happen because Britain had the largest working class in Europe. And uh, Russia didn't seem like a really promising place for a socialist revolution because there were so many peasants. And if you read Marx, he doesn't say much about peasants. He thinks peasants are stupid. He once said that peasants... Uh, their heads are shaped like shovels because they shovel pig poop all day and they're stupid and they're not reliable revolutionaries and, you know, the last thing you want to do is rely on them for anything. Lenin, however, has a problem. He's trying to carry off a revolution in a society where 80%, roughly, of the population are peasants. So what he simply did was he placed the, Len the, the he placed the peasantry within the proletariat. So now you had, in his view, a proletariat that existed in the countryside, you know, people who work on the, in the fields. He believed that that labor was just as valuable as the labor produced in the factories by real working class people, uh, those who slave away in the factories. Secondly, Lenin developed the idea that the Communist Party was the vanguard of socialism. We don't see this in Marx. Marx didn't talk much about a disciplined, um, well-organized party that would guide the working class 
to the socialist utopia. And that's really what distinguishes Marxism, Leninism from plain old Marxism. Lenin and Trotsky spent a lot of time developing the idea that the Soviet Union would be a, a workers' paradise because they, they would essentially use the Communist Party to lead the workers towards socialism. The party would educate the workers to be good socialists. So this is something to really think about when you when you discuss this, the Soviet Union. You think about it. The Communist Party has an, a huge role in Soviet history. It is in, it, it's the most influential institution in that society. And you can see on the poster on the left, in Russian it says, Parti Lenina Slava, Glory to the Party of Lenin. And even though this is from the 1980s, uh, it's not unusual. Uh, you see all over the Soviet Union posters, you know, uh, movies, radio programs, all dedicated to glorifying the party. So the you know it's very very it's a very very important um, aspect of of um, of the Soviet experience the centrality of the Communist Party. I remember in the 1980s there was a Russian comedian uh, his name was Yakov Smirnov and uh, he was popular for a while and he said in America you could always find a party in the Soviet Union the party always finds you. So that's sort of a testament to the, the far reach of the Communist Party within Soviet society. Now that you have a general sense of what Marxism and Leninism is and how important it was to the Soviet Union, we can now discuss some other issues that really emanate from this ideology. First of all, in the Soviet Union, Marxism-Leninism was raised to the level of scientific law. It became a discipline unto itself in school, uh, whether it's elementary school or middle school or high school or, or university. Students all took courses in Marxism-Leninism. So it became uh, just as, as important as biology or history or sociology or economics or engineering or medicine. Everyone had to know essentially what Marxism Leninism was and how important it was to the Soviet, uh, to, to the Soviet Union. One of the negative outcomes of Marxism Leninism, and we see this during the purges of the 1920s and 30s, is that the fact that those who question or resist the party were considered class enemies. So, if you were someone who questioned the ideology, then party uh, you know, party uh, leaders would look at you and say, "Well, um, you are obviously a bourgeois sympathizer or a capitalist sympathizer who really needs to um, be reeducated or or put into jail or." There's something wrong with you. You know, you don't have the proper class consciousness. And lastly, as I mentioned before, the party controlled the political, social, economic, and cultural life of the Soviet Union. So again, um, in very few societies in the 20th century do we see the party being so overwhelmingly influential. Uh, the Nazi party in Germany, the fascist party in Italy weren't quite as as important um, as the, the Communist Party was in the Soviet Union. In 1921, the new economic policy was introduced by Lenin as an attempt to revitalize the Soviet economy. As you may recall, the Russian Civil War, the Russian Revolution, and World War I had caused great damage to Russian economic infrastructure. Railroads, farmland, factories had been damaged or destroyed. In addition, millions of people had died. So if you look at what was going on in the 1920s in terms of uh, Russian economic and social life, things were incredibly difficult. So Lenin believed that capitalism could be used to help jumpstart some economic activity. 
Now, you may re- recall that uh, he's not a great fan of capitalism. He sees it as a great danger. However, uh, in 1921, the Soviet leadership has very few options as to how to get the economy rolling again. So what the new economic policy allowed was some private enterprise. So in the countryside, farmers could sell their grain at market for a profit. People in the city could uh, open up stalls selling food or, or trinkets or, or other items to uh, to make a living. So it was really a time when uh, Lenin began to move away from war communism, where the so when the Soviet state took over the entire economy during the revolution in the Civil War. So here we start to see people beginning to buy and sell on their own. And if you look at the kind of problems that they're facing, it really was made worse by the fact that the United States, Britain, and France, the three countries that would have money to lend, uh, refused to lend money to the Soviets because the Soviet state professed to be a communist state and a revolutionary state and anti-capitalist and very little investment is flowing in. The only person who really was interested in doing business was Henry Ford, who actually signed a contract with the new Soviet government to sell trucks, especially farm uh, trucks, to help farmers in the countryside uh, develop the land. So you can see that uh, in the 1920s, the new Soviet state is really struggling to get the economic infrastructure rebuilt. And if you look at this picture on the right that was taken in the Ukraine in 1920, you can see the abject poverty that people were experiencing in the countryside. And that was what the new economic policy was really meant to uh, alleviate. By 1928, Stalin was firmly in control of the party. Lenin, who had died in 1924 of a stroke, had wished for power to be passed on to Trotsky. However, Stalin was able to outmaneuver Trotsky and send him into exile that same year, in 1928. So, immediately, Stalin ended NEP, and he began a very ambitious collectivization and industrialization program. By collectivization, I mean that the Soviet state took over all farmland within the Soviet Union, and organize it into state collectives where farmers would not own the land, but they would simply work on the collective and collect a paycheck. Okay? Secondly, a very vast industrialization program was begun by Stalin. And with very little resources coming in from outside, from the, the capitalist powers, And with the onset of the Great Depression in 1929, Stalin was determined to use state power to develop industry within the Soviet Union. Now, if we look at the development of industrialization in places like Britain, it took 80, 100 years for industry to establish itself. Stalin wanted industry to be established within 10 years because he wanted to keep up with the Germans and he wanted to keep up with the Americans and the British. So you had a situation where workers were using picks and shovels and hammers and nails and their bare hands to build uh, to build factories. And in terms of a working class, during the Russian Civil War, the workers had left the cities because there was very little food, and they went back to the farm. So Stalin has a very serious problem. How do I build a working class? And the way he did it was through very determined state initiatives. He would locate workers in the countryside. He would send Communist Party officials to people's doorsteps and he would knock on the door and say uh, you comrade and your family will be on the next train to Moscow you will be given an apartment and you and your wife will begin work at this factory 
So by using state power, he was able to manufacture a working class. As you can imagine, this very ambitious program was going to have a real high cost, not only in terms of uh, money, which the state didn't have a whole lot of, but also there's a very large human cost here, because you're you're literally moving people from the farms who are not going to work there right into the cities to become to become workers. So, in order to keep the support of the Soviet population, Stalin and the party began to build a very extensive Soviet welfare state, and what this meant was that the state would provide uh, benefits to ordinary Soviet citizens, guaranteed employment, every person was guaranteed a job, free education and health care, subsidized housing and food, every worker would get an apartment, would get a job, access to health, access to education. And this is really what allowed... Stalin to enjoy a large measure of support. And you have to understand this about dictatorships. It's not all about the secret police holding a gun to your head. Certainly that's part of it. You know, there's, there's this, um, sense of overreaching state power, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. But there's also the goodies and the benefits. In order for any kind of dictatorship to survive, there must be a large measure of public support, and this is how the Soviets were able to do it, to this very extensive welfare state. An important part of the collectivization and industrialization program was the development of the five-year plans. Um, it was up to the party and economic planners to develop the Soviet economy in five-year chunks. So every five years, planners would get together and they would plan how much the Soviet economy would need to produce in terms of uh, heavy industry, you know, cars, trucks, buildings, etc., and also in terms of food, in terms of consumer goods, um, you know, uh, uh, shoes, clothing, things of this nature. So you have what is really um, another hallmark of of communism, the command economy. It's the opposite of capitalism. In capitalism, there is supply and demand. In the command economy, the state provides uh, the goods that go into the shops that people buy. And the major problem with the command economy was that if the planners underestimated the growth of the Soviet population, then you would have shortages. And that was a real problem in the Soviet Union. The planners could never really plan accurately the growth in population. So if they decided that 20 million cars would have to be, 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 you know, be built in five years, all of a sudden there would be 25 million people who would need them. So there were very long waiting lists for people to get cars and even to get apartments. You had to wait two or three years for your apartment to be built before you could move into it. So you'd have to live with your in-laws after you get married, things of this nature. So that's why in the Soviet Union you had long lines. It was once written that the average Soviet woman spent three hours per day in line waiting for different kinds of goods, clothing, food, etc. So the command economy was meant to be a fair way to get all of these things to the marketplace, but it proved to be very, very inefficient. This picture of Joseph Stalin really gives us a good sense of the forcefulness of his character. He was Secretary General of the Communist Party from 1928 until his death in 1953, and it's really undisputed that he was at the center of party life during those years. And he got his uh, t the title of Secretary General in a very curious way. In the 1920s, Lenin and uh, Trotsky were really wondering what to do with Stalin. Uh, he had shown himself to be somewhat of a brute. Uh, he was uh, someone they felt who you know couldn't be trusted. 
And I didn't think he was that smart. They thought he was a dumb peasant from Georgia uh, who uh, really wouldn't amount to much and really would be more trouble than he was worth. So they decided, they decided to make him secretary general of the party, which really meant that he would be able to uh, attend party meetings, but he would take notes. You know, he would do the mundane job of taking notes and drawing up the the meeting agendas and all that. And Lenin and uh, Trotsky figured this will keep him out of trouble. But what, what they didn't realize was that Stalin was actually keeping notes not only of the party meetings, but he was also taking notes of other party members in their private and professional business. So he began to develop dossiers on members of the Communist Party. And after Lenin died in 1924, it was obvious that Lenin wanted Trotsky to take uh, to take over. However, Stalin, in his job as secretary, had developed so many files and such scandalous negative information on other par- members of the party, he was able to essentially outmaneuver Trotsky uh, in the late 1920s, and Trotsky was exiled and sent out of the country, and Stalin uh, kept the title Secretary General. So uh, they really underestimated the political skills of uh, of Stalin, and uh, Trotsky, who was assassinated by one of Stalin's agents in 1940, unfortunately uh, it took him too long to figure this out. One of the most unfortunate outcomes of the Soviet experiment was that in the 1920s and 1930s, the Soviet Union became a police state. And what this means is uh, the police and the army are not restrained by law. They can use any means necessary, including violent, to keep order. And that individual citizens do not have recourse to a court of law. And (coughs) this is really what the Soviets have in common with uh, Nazi Germany, the idea that uh, you are really subject to the will of the government, and once you are suspected of being an enemy, whether it's true or false, you can be punished severely, either executed or sent off to to prison. Felix Dzerzhinsky was named by Lenin as head of the Cheka, which was responsible for state security. The Cheka eventually became the NKVD under Stalin, and then after that became the KGB. And it's basically the secret police, and they were given the power to to watch people, to keep files on people, to arrest them for very little, for you know, for no reason whatsoever, on very little evidence. Uh, also, it um, encouraged an informant's culture in the Soviet Union, whereby people were encouraged to inform on their neighbors or their families or their friends for any kind of un-Soviet or unpatriotic or anti-communist uh, behavior or comment. So during this period, millions of Soviet citizens were executed or sent to the Gulag. Now, the Gulag was... Uh, a series of, of prison complexes that spread out from from uh, European Russia right through Siberia. So millions of people simply disappeared during this period. And it really, for, for historians, really complicates things because here we have an obvious negative um, outcome of the Soviet experience. But on the other hand, we do have some positives with... Um, the Soviet welfare state. So the Soviet experience is, you know, can be looked at in many different ways depending on your perspective. As a police state, a dictatorship that that murdered millions, but at the same time provided benefits through a very generous welfare state. And this is something that historians still grapple with. Nothing illustrates the tragedy of the Soviet experience than the show trials of the 1930s. During that decade, Stalin began a massive purge of the Communist Party. And what I mean by purge is he began to rid the party of anyone he believed would be a threat to his power. Dramatic show trials occurred, meaning uh, 
people in the party who were denounced by him as being enemies of the people, as being capitalist sympathizers, as being traitors, were put on trial. And these trials were put on the radio, and they were put on newsreels, and they became uh, sort of a central part of Soviet politics in the 1930s. And many of these people who were put on trial were tortured and forced to sign confessions saying that they did in fact do things to to undermine Stalin's power. So you know, enemy like Stalin, you know, a man like uh, uh, like like Stalin, he certainly did have enemies within the party. However, if we look at someone like Nikolai Bukharin, uh who was an associate of Lenin's and considered an old Bolshevik, uh those who fought during the revolution were called old Bolsheviks. Uh he was a critic of Stalin's collectivization and industrialization program. He was a brilliant economist and was one of those talented Soviet leaders who was executed by Stalin and was seen as a real threat. So all of the ideals that we see being developed during the revolution, the idea of the Soviet welfare state where workers could get free health care and education and jobs, uh, this was really betrayed by Stalin in the 1930s. So not only people like Bukharin, who were very high in the party, not only they suffered, but millions of other Soviet citizens suffered as well, either through execution or through uh, time spent in the gulag.